It's been a rough week for Microsoft. Between Recall, the AI feature that was watching your computer while you used your computer and was using AI to figure out what you were doing, that got recalled entirely. Also, a series of vulnerabilities got released publicly, one of them being a completely unauthenticated Wi-Fi vulnerability. There have not been a lot of details from Microsoft about this Wi-Fi bug, but I want to go into this video and talk about how I think the Wi-Fi attack most likely works. Now, if you're new here, hi, my name is Ed. I am Low Level Learning. This is a channel where I talk about software security, cybersecurity, and all kinds of other stuff. So if you like that or just want to hang out, hit that sub button. Also, if you hear me crackling my voice a little bit, I am sick. So right now, this is really the only official information we have about this bug. The Windows Wi-Fi driver is a starting point, right? So every piece of code in Windows is broken up either into kernel land or user land. I made a video about League of Legends about this, how much I disliked the uh, Vanguard anti-cheat because it was driver side, it was kernel mode code. Um, but so every piece of code in Windows, if it's in user land, has an associated kernel mode piece that has to run privileged software to do things with your computer. So Windows internally does have a Wi-Fi driver that runs at the kernel level to be able to process the Wi-Fi frames and present them to the user so that they can choose the Wi-Fi network they want to use to parse the Wi-Fi information to get traffic off the air and stuff like that. The Wi-Fi driver remote code execution vulnerability known as CVE 2024-30078 released a few days ago. All we really have here are these basic, basic metrics that kind of define how we get this uh, CVSS score, which is an 8.8 .8 out of 10. There's also a, a second variant that says it's a 7.7. .7. I think the reason that it's not a full 10 out of 10 is that the first part here says we have to be adjacent. So what this basically means is that because this bug is in a, you know, an RF protocol like Bluetooth or IEEE 802.11, so Wi-Fi, um, you need to be next to another person to be able to attack this code stack. And we'll go later in the video and talk about kind of how that works and why that's important for this bug uh, and what it means to be vulnerable to this bug, right? So what's scary is that not only is it a remote code execution vulnerability in the Windows kernel, uh, but it's also a low attack complexity. Now, again, they don't do give a lot of detail about what this actually means. My fat head is blocking it, but I'll read that it says, specialized access conditions or extenuating circumstances do not exist. An attacker can expect repeatable success against the vulnerable components. So that means that there isn't a lot you have to do to make the computer vulnerable. It is vulnerable by default, right? And so you need the user who's getting attacked needs to have zero interaction. Uh, the privileges required to do this attack are nuns. So basically, you can go from unauthenticated remote to kernel mode authenticated via this exploit. Now, again, they don't go into any detail about this bug other than the fact that it was found by Kunlun Lab, which is a cybersecurity research lab, I believe, in Beijing, China. Uh, and they said, hey, thanks for finding the bug. I appreciate it, which means I'm assuming these guys uh, reported it to Microsoft. So good on them, right? You may be thinking, oh, I'm on a Wi-Fi network right now, but it's secured. I'm using WPA2 with AES encryption. Like that means that I'm not vulnerable to this attack, right? And that's not actually entirely true. So the way that Wi-Fi works is you have different modes of Wi-Fi sessions, right? And the frames exist, the, the frames of data that go over the air that your CPU processes exist at different authentication levels. So for example, I literally Googled, you know, Windows Wi-Fi network selector. Uh, and what this is showing here is that the computer that I'm showing you can see all of these different networks. And how, how can it see these networks? How does it know that there's a network called Mike called TG1672 and, and called Panther, right? How, how can that all exist? Well, the way that it could exist is that the 802.11 or Wi-Fi spec actually emits management frames that your computer is required to via the RFC, the request for comments, it is required to process them without authentication. Now, again, if, if there are any hackers that are watching this video, your computer is required to process them without any authentication. Now, while the frames themselves may have no malicious intent, any piece of code that exists anywhere is likely to have memory corruption vulnerabilities. The average is that there is one memory corruption vulnerability per 1,000 lines of code in a memory unsafe language like C or C++. For example, right, we have these management frames and there are these different, you know, seven different subtypes. I can't count. How many is this? This is four, this is 12. I'm gonna say this is, this is 13. I'm just gonna guess. I'm not counting on camera right now. Uh, these are the different kinds of management frames that exist in the Wi-Fi spec, right? 
And so your computer, the Windows driver in this specific example, is required to have code to run and parse every single one of these management frames to include a deauthentication frame, an authentication frame, and a beacon, for example. The beacon is the one that emits data that your computer processes to say that, hey, look, a Wi-Fi network exists. And so why does this matter as it applies to this vulnerability? Now, how does this apply to this vulnerability? Now, again, because Microsoft didn't put any official documentation out about what is happening here, I'm going to make an educated guess. What I think that is likely happening is that there are definite, there are constant changes to Wi-Fi specs, right? For example, there's a new Wi-Fi spec called WPA3. You may be familiar with WPA2, which is just a Wi-Fi protection, I believe, alliance or association Basically, it's just a standard for protecting Wi-Fi networks, right? As these new standards come out, people are required to write code in the Windows drivers, the Wi-Fi driver, for example, to be able to parse the data required in the spec, right? And so within the WPA spec, you have new features, new password management, there's perfect forward secrecy in WPA3. And so someone has to be there at Microsoft to write the code into the driver to handle all this. With new code, comes new vulnerabilities. So I think what is happening here most likely is researchers at Kunlun Labs, uh, Wei, I think is his name, uh, found a vulnerability in the way that these management uh, frames are parsed, right? And again, the reason that I'm assuming it is a management frame and not some other frame like a, uh, you know, like a data frame while you're in a Wi-Fi session is because there is no attack complexity and there is no privilege required. So I think what it literally means is that someone can broadcast a malicious SSID with some kind of malicious management frame. And once that happens, your computer internally will process it in the Wi-Fi driver. Some kind of overflow happens somewhere, which gives you remote code execution on your CPU. So overall, not a great place to be. Now, how is this different than all of the like, oh, connecting to, you know, FBI van Wi-Fi network in public? Like that's dangerous, obviously, right? How is this different than that? Well, so the difference is that when you are connecting to a public Wi-Fi network, the reason it used to be traditionally thought as unsafe was back in the day, like pre-2010, before websites all used SSL by default. And if you don't know what SSL is, SSL is the layer of security in the HTTP stack that encrypts every web connection in an encryption scheme. So you do a key exchange with your server and you get a key back and the key is used to protect your data when you're talking to the server. Now, prior to HTTPS being the norm, it used to be that when you went to like a bank website, for example, you would just slam your password in there, your bank information, your social into that bank website, and there'd be no encryption to protect your data. So the thought was if you wrap the network in the encryption, you know, no one could watch you do your banking. And so it was, it was thought that public Wi-Fi networks that were not encrypted were dangerous. Uh, so now the difference is that, you know, while public Wi-Fi, you are putting your computer onto a network where you don't know who else is there, the data confidentiality piece is not necessarily broken because there's no because all of the data is encrypted through HTTPS. Now there is a vulnerability of man in the middles where effectively someone can intercept your key exchange and effectively sit in the middle and provide you and the server different keys and watch your traffic in between. But browsers and modern computers are very good at catching this. The only real risk to public Wi-Fi is that if you are using an old version of an OS with a publicly known or even maybe like a zero day vulnerable operating system, someone can throw that at your computer because you are now sitting in the same vicinity of, uh, of the attacker. When I talk to people a lot of times about responsible disclosure and withholding information about vulnerabilities, people get kind of confused. And I want to kind of explain why I think Microsoft didn't reveal exactly how and where this vulnerability exists. The reason is that this bug is extremely dangerous. And in particular, this is called a wormable vulnerability. The idea being, if someone knew how to run this bug, they could exploit the vulnerability. And then from that compromised machine, exploit another person using the same vulnerability and effectively take over any computer that that person walks near, right? Again, this is a proximal attack. You have to be within Wi-Fi range to use this exploit. So Microsoft most likely was thinking to prevent some gigantic global takedown of all Windows computers that have Wi-Fi, uh, it's better to quietly fix and not give details about this bug than it would be to show everyone where and how to, to do the vulnerability. You can do what people call patch diffing. So if you have the old vulnerable version and the new not vulnerable version, if you do binary diffing, you can see the overlay of the two pieces of code and figure out what code changed and therefore where the vulnerability exists. Uh, that is a very complex kind of technique to, to find bugs in software post-patch, post but people do do it. 
Uh, yes, yeah, so I think that's probably why Microsoft held on to or is going to hold on to the vulner to the details. Now, how can you protect yourself? Do like any good cybersecurity practitioner and just update your computer. I know, oh, Microsoft evil. Okay, cool. Awesome. Got it. Like update your computer. Thank you. That's all you have to do. <laughs> Rough week for Microsoft, dude. I hope they, uh, I hope they're doing okay. You know, I, I know we're all a little mad about the recall thing. Uh, but they do unfortunately run the world. So anyway, if you like this video, do me a favor, hit like, hit subscribe, and then go check out this video about a guy that I talked to who found a vulnerability, not in one modem, not in two, but thousands across his entire ISP. Absolutely wild. We'll see you guys there. Appreciate it.